Um, just before, and also just want to acknowledge, we've got the chair of the New Zealand Accounting Standards Board with us, Carolyn Cordery. Carolyn, did you, did you want to say anything before I kick the meeting off? Well, I didn't know if you wanted me to say something now or a little bit later, but um, certainly I uh, thank you, Angus and uh, Patricia and Teresa, for your work on this. And uh, before that, um, you know, other staff, well, and all the other staff who've uh, who've worked on the um, on the project, the boards are certainly committed to um, use. Uh, IFRS uh, suitably modified for the public sector. Obviously, in New Zealand, we uh, we want to use uh, IPSAS, but the IPSAS B has not um, has not issued a standard for insurance. So the aim of this project has been to take IFRS 17 and make it practical to be implemented uh, in the public sector without compromising the principles that that are being used. So. Certainly, uh, we're, we're looking forward to feedback on the uh, EDs as exposed in Australia and New Zealand, which are very similar, and Angus will take us through those issues, uh, and the boards are looking forward to uh, hearing the feedback from, from you all um, for that and um, get, you know, getting submissions. Uh, so, Angus, I'm happy to hand back to you to go through the, the technical issues and, and uh, looking forward to the feedback. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Carolyn, appreciate that. Um, so what I'm going to do is just briefly introduce each topic and then ask for feedback from people. We're not going to ask for a vote. Um, we're all hope, hoping you're going to put in your submissions and we can see whether you agree or disagree with our proposals in those submissions. Um, if you're wondering why the question numbers start at number 10, um, we can count, but we the, the way the the questions are numbered in the ED is the order in which the paragraphs appear in the standard, so we'll propose them. Um, but that's not necessarily, I guess, a, a logical order from the point of view of discussion. So we've tried to reorder it for the purposes of the round table. Um, so really kicking off with a fairly non-technical type issue, the boards obviously um, aim to, well, we're aiming to get this proposed standard um, finalised in the last quarter of 2022, and in order to give people enough time to have an understanding of it and implement it, um, we're suggesting pushing the application date out um, in, for the AASB, 1st of July 2025, so the first period you would report would be 30 June 2026, and New Zealand's got a 1 January date, but it has the same effect. So you would be first required to apply this for 30 June 2026, with, of course, a comparative year. So I'd be very interested to get feedback from people on whether they think that's a reasonable time frame. Is it too long? Is it too short? Um, of course, early application is permitted as well. So any feedback on that? Uh, Richard here from ACC in New Zealand. Um, I guess obviously longer is better. We we understand obviously the, the 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 want to bring this standard in. I guess our only question would be how long it's taken the private sectors to implement the standard. And whilst we are slightly different, we do have a lot of the same issues. I guess with systems um, in particular. My background's mainly on the actuarial side, and we are maybe slightly more um, easily adaptable to new standards than sort of accounting systems and processes. And I don't think we at ACC have done much undertaking in terms of how the system may need to be modified to take all of the uh, implications of IFRA 17 into account. So. I understand the desire to put it through. Um, I just um, be good to understand the some of the practical issues that the private insurers have had. Well, I mean, from from my experience, lots of issues. <laughs> I, I guess <clears throat> two things about that. I'm, I'm, we're kind of hoping that that experience will benefit the public sector when they come along to implement it. So hopefully, some of the bugs have been ironed out. Um, 
the other thing is, I guess, depending on where the proposed, where the actual requirements land, um, I think the proposals probably smooth the path a little bit as well. Um, of course, if some of those proposals didn't get up, that might make it all the more difficult to implement. So we'd yeah. have to, and, and I think the board would, has made the date um, one, well, WSB one July, New Zealand board one January 2025 on the basis of the proposal. So I guess if the proposals were tougher in the end, then they might consider extending the date. So yeah, it's a package. Yeah, and look, and I agree. I think the initial date was earlier than 2025, so I think we're happy that it's been pushed out that far. So, um, can I also echo Richard's comments? It's Jane Clifford from iCare. Um, I guess from our point of view, our concern is around the more social benefit type schemes that we look after. And whilst we've been very proactive in looking at those schemes that we manage that have ins clear insurance contracts. If we're looking at additional schemes that come in in that social benefits space, then we're going to it's going to be very tight to get um, in by that 30th of June 2026 date. So any extension possible, we would appreciate. Okay, thanks for that, Jane. Anybody else want to weigh in on the application day? Uh, just that uh, I guess, Angus, that I um, I, I kind of echo that last comment. I think um, if you're changing from an uh, IFRS 4 uh, appendix um, approach to a um, IFRS 17, my expectation would be that it would, wouldn't be quite as hard a move as, in, as indeed a uh, or might be for a few European, for example, uh, uh, changes. So, so, but but if you're changing from a, a um, something that's not on IFRS um, uh, for uh, the appendices, so something that might have been in the social insurance space that is now caught in that, then then I think there would there would be change. So I, I guess it's just that the boards have regard to what they're seeing in that when they make the decision would be would be my um, suggestion and request. Thanks, Kim. Anyone else on application day? I'm going to take that as a we'll move on. But thank you very much for that. And it's a good segue um, actually, because the next one is scope, uh, and there are a series of questions there. So the board, the boards are proposing approach where you, you you examine a set of indicators and work out whether you fall within seventeen or not. Um, I guess one of the interesting things about IFRS seventeen is it's while it, it's the ISB sort of touts its credentials in terms of it's a transaction-based standard. There are certain transactions which are completely scoped out that would probably otherwise be insurance. Um, and the boards noted that when they developed these proposals. Um, and those are, for example, if you're a manufacturer or dealer um, and you sell a product warranty for the product you deal in or manufacture, then you're exempt from applying 17. Um, so there are some fairly um, blanket exemptions from that standard, which as I said, is quite unusual. Um, having said that though, the board decided to adopt a principle-based approach where you look at a set of indicators and have to make a judgment, um, a collective assessment, which on balance, are you do you have insurance contracts or not? One of the um, comments that we often receive is, well, if there's an insurance contract, it should be in 17, and if there isn't, it shouldn't. I guess the complicating factor with um, 17 and with a lot of IFRS standards is that you don't just look at the contract between the two parties, you're also looking at the legislative background, or the whole legislative and regulatory framework. And, you know, in that respect, um, I've been, for example, uh, having a look at the recent legislation that was passed in Australia, 
on the cyclone reinsurance pool. Um, I think that was passed at the end of March. And you've really got to look, if, if you look at that legislation, for example, it's got a paragraph in there or clause in there that requires the AR um, Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation to do a long run form of pricing. In other words, they're supposed to take a long-term view. So there's no doubt that the legislation does have an impact on the actual substance of the contracts that are being um, made between public sector entities and third parties. So I guess that's been the complication with just blanket saying, well, if it's an insurance contract, you're in, and if it's not, you're not. You've actually got to work out in substance whether you've got an insurance contract based on all these facts and circumstances, um, which are highlighted in these indicators. Um, so we ask a series of questions, you know, whether people agree with the indicators, do they think there's anything missing, do they think we should drop one, and or do they think we need to rank them in some way. So at the moment they're not ranked, um, they're just all set out there and you, you're supposed to decide which in your circumstances um, is most significant. So I'd like to open that up for comments, please. Oh, I'm happy to kick this one off. Um, so Richard here, here again, ACC. Um, I, I did like, I guess, the inclusion of the indicators um, to give a view of whether or not this sort of the product services, whatever you want to call it, that we provide is insurance and or whether or not then we fall into the standard or something else. Um, the majority of our accounts, for want of a better word, uh, easily, I guess, fall into the insurance bucket. Where it is grey for us is um, what we define as the non-earner accounts. So they are where we get an appropriation directly from the government. So arguably the individuals who are covered, I guess, are not actually paying a direct levy it comes from the general taxation pool um, but we we certainly would not want to have to report um, under two separate standards um, for our whole portfolio per se so that was that was probably one of the main indicators that we had a question on arguably um, maybe some of the underwriting type ones as well where we obviously don't underwrite technically we do sort of make sure you're eligible at claim time but there is no underwriting done up front um, and so again this is just a question around how rigorous you have to um, uh, fall into all of them so on a, on a sort of overall basis we were broadly comfortable that we satisfied the criteria but I guess there's a couple of questions that we had and didn't want sort of an adverse outcome at the end of it. Thanks, Richard. Um, David? Uh, you're, you're on mute still, David. Um, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Angus. Um, yeah, so so in Queensland, you know, some are you know clearly in, in and they they look and behave like insurance contracts. And they actually are insurance contracts uh, there. So the the ones that we've got difficulty with are the catastrophic insurance um, ones, and we're we're getting different views. So someone reads it, particularly if they don't want to apply the new standard, they sort of say it's out. Um, others say it's sort of in. If you do lots and lots of reading, you can sort of so it's in once you read the definitions of insurance contract that actually doesn't link to a sort of a, a, a policy holder as such, or I'm sorry, policy payer as such. Um, so they've got, you know, de the definition essentially says, well, essentially someone who, I don't want to say receives the proceeds because that's getting to, to the legal um, issue, but someone who's essentially the beneficiary of the insurance. Uh, again, that's another bloated term. Um, but yeah, the definition of insurance contract actually doesn't need a, a link between the person receiving the benefit and, and sort of a paying a premium. 
and that's a bit to get over. So I, I can see it, it these things getting covered, um, but it's not clear to me to essentially say to someone who really is a, of a strong mind that they aren't covered and still want to do, you know, 137 type calculations. So that's the difficulty I've got. And having said that, I, I'm, I'm not really too sure that that's the intention to cover these things either. Um, so it's, yeah, again, it's the catastrophic injury, uh, the nominal defendant type example where um, people are getting covered for a car accident um, when the person is not insured type of thing. Yeah, so, so, so I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> No, uh, I will make a comment, but I'll go to Ken first. Yes. Ken, you're on mute. Uh, apologies, there we go. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I think the critical judgment that that will be being made will be, is it an insurance contract or is it an open-ended arrangements to provide benefits uh, based on eligibility and the the more catastrophic stuff that uh, that David's just been talking about is the, is the is the area that kind of falls into that camp uh, camp uh, the, the the most it's um, and and at the moment I think the the way the ed is worded you the judgment call is a toss up. Uh, and that's not really what I want from a standard. And, and I'm actually recently, I'm actually recently agnostic which way it goes, but I, but I, but I, I don't really want the spend a lot of money and time and making that, that, that judgment, which I think I'm going to have to be at the moment, at the moment. Thanks, Ken. Um, it's going to go to Warwick. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Angus. I suppose my view is that looking at the indicators, I think we're going to be careful here that we're, we're not trying to bring in uh, business indicators where some of these arrangements are not necessarily a normal running of a business. I, I look at the some of the indicators there where it's assets held, and it may not be the, the um, various schemes and arrangements may not actually have assets set aside for their schemes, it might be under a government guarantee or an appropriation. I think my view is in the public sector, this is more a way of uh, valuing, putting a valuation on the liability and the, and the commitment stream other than the asset side. And I th so I think the, the assets indicator is probably not as important as some of the other ones, whereas the, um, managing the risks and, a, and a, an arrangement and identifiable coverage. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Hori. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, with, oh, actually, I'll go to Will. Will. Yeah, thank you, Angus. I think I just want to pick up on the comment that David raised before, just around consistency and, I guess, um, to address that point, because when we look at the purpose of, of IFRS 17 as a whole, it was... Uh, to help drive consistency around accounting for insurance contracts. So I look at it in terms of locally and in the public sector context, um, the outcome that we'd want to avoid from, from, these, from this standard is um, can, um, uh, accounting or difference in views in terms of whether arrangements fall within the scope between jurisdictions that are essentially the same scheme. And um, in terms of my firm, KPMG, we did have a conversation regarding whether the use of illustrative examples may help uh, address any concerns regarding consistency, but I'd also note, um, and I think this is where Warwick's comment was going to, um, uh, a ranking of, of the indicators as well would help address that point because certainly the, the situation that we, in our view, we really want to avoid is, is arrangements which are effectively being the same, being accounted for differently between uh, jurisdictions. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, I mean, one thing that the IASB sometimes does, um, for example, in the employee benefits document, you've got to decide whether you've got a defined benefit retirement plan or a defined contribution retirement plan. They say, well, if you're in any doubt, 
it's defined benefit. Now, the, I guess the issue has been that the AASB is not and the New Zealand board are not trying to get people into 17. We're trying to get consistency. So in a sense, we're ambivalent about which one you're in, provided we think you're in the right one. So we, the boards had decided not to sort of put in a blanket, well, if you're in any doubt, you're in 17, or if you're in any doubt, you're in provision standard. But I, I'd just be interested to know if anyone thinks that might be a good idea. In other words, a sort of default position. What would the default be, in or out? Because I yes. think if, if the default is in, people will complain. If the default is out, yay, yeah. <laughs> we're not covered. Hey. Yeah, or, or someone might want to be in 17 and not 37. So yeah, that, that's the problem. And that's why boards haven't done it. Um, any other contributions on the scope issue? Um, I guess from ICARE's point of view, um, the less ambiguity, the better. So ensuring that um, that the indicators are very, very clear. Um, we, we echo the view that the assets held the benefits um, isn't, isn't really appropriate from what we can see. Um, we also think there should be prerequisites to get into the standard. So, for example, um, enforceable arrangements would be something that we would think is in line with more of an insurance contract and therefore a prerequisite prior to going to those other indicators. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Jane. Any other views? Okay, I'm going to take that as a, a no. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to the subgrouping question. Um, and obviously, this is one of the things um, people mentioned earlier, uh, the work involved in implementing IFRS 17. Certainly one of the big issues, if you've been applying in Australia 1023, or in New Zealand, uh, the appendix to NZIFRS 4, you will most likely be using the portfolio as your basic unit of account. Um, IFRS 17 requires you to subgroup um, at least into two or three groups, um, onerous and non-onerous, and also by date of issue. So you can't just collapse three successive generations of annual generations of contracts into one unit of account. The grouping is by contracts issued no more than 12 months apart. And so that has created uh, a lot of work, um, people creating subledges and whatnot um, in the private sector to cope with that. The, so at the moment, the proposal though is to provide relief to public sector entities. And the reason behind that essentially has been that most public sector entities are trying to break even in the long run. So the fact that you've got onerous contracts um, in one period and maybe profitable ones in the next isn't such a big deal um, as it is in the commercial sector where people are, in theory at least, always trying to issue profitable contracts. So the proposal at the moment is to provide relief, you would not need to subgroup and essentially uh, would be using portfolios uh, as your basic unit of account in all likelihood. You could of course go lower, but there'd be no requirement to under the proposals. So I'd welcome any feedback you might have, positive or negative or any alternative suggestions. I'm happy to kick off this one. Um, we're very supportive of the relief, echo your sentiments that we don't price to make profit, so there's no real value in splitting those contracts up into the three groups. The 90% of our contracts, if not more, would be onerous. So we're supportive of 
um, having that relief provided. I concur. Um, so again, agree entirely with what Jane just said. I think, um, and again, the the way that we price, the majority of the time we would be onerous, uh, but because we do hold assets, if if at some point we had sufficiently few assets and we needed to over um, levy essentially, then they would be unonerous for that year or whatever, and so it just becomes messy. So uh, it's good, and I was I didn't quite get it maybe when I first read it quickly, but not having to do it by year would also be beneficial. We've probably got the information more at hand, but um, again, we'll take we'll take that exemption too. Thank you. If I could just chip in there, I mean, I have, have heard the comment that people are very supportive of not having onerous versus non-onerous, but perhaps they see less of a case for the um, annual cohort. So I'd be very interested in knowing if anyone holds that view or holds a very strong view that no, the annual cohort relief would also provide, uh, would also be extremely useful and, and not detrimental to the reporting um, or an alternative view. I, I, well, I guess just, just based on what I was just saying before, I mean, because we take a I think the, the more rich information is what we do on a, when we do a repricing of the levy um, and the information that comes out of that from an annual perspective, I guess. Um, so that in collection with the annual reporting is probably more rich than having a disaggregated um, set of information in the accounts because any one year could be more or less onerous than another particular year, but because we price it at total portfolio level it's I guess that's the information that we would use um, so uh, whilst it somewhat is useful we we really just care about the overall view so that's probably our view on it yeah thanks for that Richard I mean I guess that sort of um, is consistent with one of the other reasons the board proposed that is that if you look at most of the balance sheets of the public sector entities, claims are sort of a much bigger deal than coverage as well. And so this split up is based on coverage. Um, once you get into the claims area, um, you know, it's a different story. So I guess just on that as well, you um, know, I have had also comments that given the significance of the claims liability, you know, is there any, are there any special requirements or disclosures you think we might need to have around claims over and above what's in 17. I mean, there's already claims development requirements in 17. The board's view was perfectly adequate at the moment. Or indeed, any other thoughts on these issues about subgrouping? Angus, just um, Angela Ryan from the Treasury here. Just on your question around disclosures um, of claims effectively, um, I should know this, but can you remind me where the private sector is and in terms of actual users of private sector accounts under IFRA 17? I guess, can we learn anything from um, disclosures and whether they're, they're, they're considered you know, more useful or not, because I think um, it's quite hard to answer that question until you pull them together and put them in front of a set of users. Well, as I said, I think the, the significance of claims is much greater in the private sector. And a lot of the disclosures, I mean, there are, there are what they call roll forward tables that you've got to provide under 17, which you're reconciling your, your total insurance liability. So both the coverage element and the claims element. So those disclosures effectively apply to both. Um, I think one of the most useful um, disclosures is around claims development. And that is a requirement in the standard. It's similar to the existing requirement. It's not very specific. 
For example, it doesn't tell you whether the risk adjustments included in the table or whether it's net of reinsurance or gross of reinsurance. And so there's a bit of a debate going on there um, about what might be most useful to show. And if, if you look at practice in the commercial sector, some insurers have traditionally done. So this is, you track the claims over time so that you effectively working out whether the estimate you made in 2013, for example, the claims that are still running was a very good estimate or not, or whether every year you keep incrementally <laughs> increasing that claims liability. So it, it's, it's a disclosure about how well you've done your provisioning effectively. Um, so people find that very useful. And I guess when the boards looked at it, they couldn't think of anything in addition that would be public sector specific that would benefit users. Um, but, you know, if people have got ideas, we'd certainly welcome them. I was just um, thinking in terms of our whole of government accounts more than specifically, say, ACC or EQC, but we do, I guess people who do read our accounts um, do find the insurance note the most complex note now. Um, and it's fair to say you probably do need quite a lot of knowledge of the insurance business to make you know, much sense of it. Um, but um, so I'm not expecting a for 17 to solve that, but I guess if we are gonna switch to a new insurance standard, it is the chance to stand back and say, how can we improve readability of it for users more generally. So it's an opportunity to sort of, we have just been, um, I guess we, we're, we're, we take very much a compliance approach, but try to improve the text around it to explain what it's trying to do. So, I mean, we do have an opportunity, but um, to be fair, Angus, I know certainly at the Treasury, we haven't even got that close to um, that part of the, the project. We're very much focused on sort of recognition measurement issues. So. I guess it's a good challenge for us to think about um, disclosures, perhaps when we're responding um, in June. Well, if you compare it to the provision standard, I mean, there's no requirement in that standard to tell people how your provision is tracked over 10 years, or is it effectively what you're being asked to do? Um, initially five, but as, as time goes by, it'll, it'll be a decade worth. Assuming your claim liabilities run over that long, and of course, in the public sector, a lot of them do. Very long tail. Um, any other comments on subgrouping before we move on? Okay, I'm going to move on to initial recognition. Uh, so, one of the requirements in IFRS 17. Um, is there's a, a three-part initial recognition requirement and you are supposed to recognise contracts um, as soon as you are bound by them and they are onerous, for example. Um, and, there are, and the other two, are, I think it's the coverage period, um, is the main one. The issue, of course, in the public sector is that you are often knowingly selling onerous contracts. Um, in fact, your whole portfolio might appear onerous from accounting terms. Um, in some extreme cases, the contract boundaries are all starting on the 1st of July or in July sometime, and therefore towards the end of the year, you're going to know you are bound um, by into a whole lot of onerous contracts. And so this requirement in paragraph 25, if we are left it unamended, would mean you would be effectively bringing forward the recognition of next year's contracts into the current year. Now that might happen consistently year after year, and therefore you might say, well, that's not a problem, but it just did seem odd to the board um, that you would have some, potentially some public sector insurers effectively recognizing next year's contracts this year. Um, so it, hence the relief uh, from that particular requirement. So effectively, it's going to be based on when the coverage commences. If I can boil it down to one single point. 
And I'd be interested to know whether people were supportive of that relief or not. I'd, I'd agree, um, particularly going back to my earlier comments that you know there's insurance contracts without an identifiable premium. Um, so you know essentially everything's onerous, I guess, uh, depending how you work out onerous. Um, yeah, because there's no matching of premium to um, to, to benefits. So uh, yeah, agree. <laughs> Yeah, I guess um, from us, it was a, just a clarification, I guess, that, um, sorry, and I don't have um, 25.1, and I might have a fire alarm going, um, so I might have to leave. So it's just it, on initial recognition, it says um, when the first payment from a policyholder becomes due, and like David was just saying, we don't, we don't get policyholder information we don't know when people become employed or lose their jobs or buy a car or a tourist and all that sort of information that people become eligible for insurance so it's understanding that we're exempt from all of that as well so and i'm going to have to go i apologize <laughs> thanks very much richard good luck uh anyone else wanting to comment Ken. Oh, I mean, you get, so if you're going to, if, yeah, it's a consequence of the earlier thing that we're all very supportive of, of not having onerous contracts separately identified. And I think this, this has to, this is consequential on that. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Any more feedback on that point? Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, next one is uh, risk adjustment. Now, this is the only proposal in the ED where the boards didn't agree. And so when you read the ED, you'll see there's effectively two proposals. Um, the AASB determined that they thought we should allow people to simply work out what their risk adjustment is based on what IFRS 17 says and not provide them with any guidance. The concern of the New Zealand board was that the notion of compensation for risk is probably fine in the commercial sector where everybody is seeking to be compensated for risk. Um, but in the public sector, where you're trying to not necessarily do that, but just break even um, and not seeking compensation for bearing risk, the issue becomes, well, do I have, for example, a zero risk adjustment or can I never contemplate having a zero risk adjustment? I must be taking on some risk and therefore I must have a positive risk adjustment. And they thought that that, debate might uh, be a waste of resources, potentially. People are arguing about which way to, to fall on that issue. And certainly in our one-on-one -on -one discussions with people, I've heard people arguing for zero, people arguing for a positive number for the risk adjustment in relatively similar circumstances. And so the New Zealand board decided to propose a rebuttable presumption of a 75% probability of adequacy or confidence level. Now, where did that come from? Essentially, if you look at practice at the moment, it's pretty well around that mark. Um, that practice, of course, is born of 1023 and the appendix to IFRS 4 in New Zealand, which tells you that the risk adjustment is about the inherent uncertainty in the cash flows. So, at the moment, you don't really have a choice about whether you've got a risk adjustment or not. If there is an inherent uncertainty in the cash flows, and you would imagine there always would be, you, you measure that, and people have tended to benchmark to a 75% confidence level. In other words, three years out of four, the number you've got on the balance sheet will indeed be adequate to meet the actual cash outflows. 
And so that's where the 75% came from. So the New Zealand board's argument is that will save a whole lot of time. People can benchmark to that. If they want to rebut it, they can. And that's their choice to spend their time and resources trying to work out what they think the risk adjustment should be. If it's not 75% probability of adequacy. Um, obviously, we would like to have the same answer, ideally, both sides of the Tasman, but we may or may not land there. Uh, so I would open up for comments or suggestions. I guess I'd be particularly interested in knowing if the Australian entities think they're going to spend a lot of time working out what their risk adjustment is. It's David here. Look, I've always had a, a problem with understanding why there's sort of zero risk margin, um, at least in the public sector. Um, but ha having said that also, I guess I come, come from a, a background of not fully understanding insurance, but sort of following what happened with the UIG. And we're talking, what, 20, 30 years ago, where the question came, should you have a prudential margin or something? Um, that was before the insurance standards as we've got them. And the answer was no. And then we have this massive, you know, the, the sec what, second largest insurer collapse with, you know, the biggest collapse in the country, $5 billion. And it seems they didn't really have a big risk margin if they had one. Um, so I don't know the details, but essentially my understanding is APRA came out and sort of said, well, you've got to use 75% um, out of that. Um, and so there's, you know, as you said, it's sort of inherent uncertainty in cash flows. And when I've had a look at it in the private sector, I, I see figures of the ones I looked at, which are sort of commercial general insurance ones of 90 plus percent, 90, 95 percent. Um, so I, I struggle with essentially a public sector institution subject to you know, similar, in, in some cases, similar variability in cash flows, not having a risk margin when the, the private sector has one. So that, that's sort of where I struggle. And even in the basis for conclusions, I struggle as to, it sort of says, you know, maybe you have one on, maybe you have zero risk margin and maybe you don't. Um, I, I'm just not, the old standard or the, the, the 1023 seems to make it simpler. Are you subject to the inherent uncertainty? Yes, outstanding claims, they could go up, they could go down. Um, let's sort of do some sort of coverage. Don't know why 75 or 90, but you know, some sort of risk for that. But then uh, having a, a public sector zero and possibly going bust and the government giving you more funds, well, you know, not too sure that's the, the right way and whether these things are set up actually to function that way of potentially going bust and the um, whole of government bailing them out. Yeah. Thanks, David. So I'm confused. <laughs> Fair enough. I will just mention one of the options on that we put before the board that they rejected was just to stick with 1023 and the existing NZI for S4, which was inherent uncertainty. Um, which which would leave you where you are today. So, but uh, that was rejected on the basis that that's, would be inconsistent with uh, the notion of compensation under seventeen. Anyone else want to chip in on on risk adjustments? Uh, uh, I'll have a quick comment. I, although I'm, I'm still formulating my views here. I have to say it's, it, it seems to me this is quite a tricky, tricky issue. Um, partly because the reason you, um, you, uh, you, 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 you change your measurement of the liability is I think a bit related to how you're going to fund that liability and and that does bring in the asset uh, part of the equation um, and if you're not paying any compensation for a government guarantee then uh, then I think you know there's a word in the standards or uh, about when you're indifferent and and I think uh, 
when you can recover your uh, the any losses that you make or any uh, kind of under under measurement you make with uh, with increased um, with increased uh, future levies, the, then the, 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 your your attitude to that risk does seem to me should be affected and should be re should be reduced. And that sort of takes me towards a an idea of having a uh, a best estimate number in the accounts and then perhaps a disclosure of what would be a kind of industry standard number in, 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 in the notes being a kind of sensible kind of solution or or or, or, or kind of useful thing so that so that you could you um, um, users of the accounts could kind of get get a their view of your best estimate of the of the um, of the liability, but also get an understanding of of how it would be would be measured if um, if you're under under a, under a corporate structure. But I, I I mean I have to say that preparers and auditors are struggling with this concept, and that means that a user that's not steeped in insurance is going to struggle even more. Um, uh, certainly, we've had to explain it to each new minister uh, that, that we've had under under the under the um, IFRS full schedules, um, and I suspect we'd still, we'll still have to do that no matter what. So it's there. There is something here about losing your audience. Um, but I, at the moment, I'm still kind of pulling together my views on this. It's a, it's a, it's a, this is quite, this, this has been tough for years. Um, thanks, Angus. And um, just for full disclosure of maybe people on the call, I, um, I was on the New Zealand Accounting Standards Board um, in the development of this ED, and I um, have to say this was a this was a particularly difficult issue that we grappled with, and I guess I guess it comes down to, and, and I was listening to David and and reminding me that um, whether you fundamentally agree that we should be using sort of best estimates in a in a on a government balance sheet given the ability to tax or increase the levy. Um, if you are in the camp that some sort of risk margin um, is required, and that's what Ken and I and, and colleagues are grappling with at the minute, um, if you are there, I do have a strong view that it should be simple. Um, it should be something that, as Ken said, we can easily explain to a minister. and. Um, where we are currently under PBEFRS4 appendices, um, it's a pretty simple statistical sufficiency idea. Um, and it's, and I understand um, in practice, it's pretty low cost to calculate. And I think the challenge that certainly I had when I was on the board is trying to actually understand what's, what the words measure the compensation the entity would require to make it indifferent between two sets of scenarios. And I was so concerned that I didn't understand those words. And if I don't charge for it, does that mean I don't need a risk margin? And, and as I've sort of, you know, been watching the private sector experience un, unwind or, you know, unfold, it seems that um, really whether you charge for it or not, is, is not the issue, it's more about the characteristics of the scheme and what kind of uncertainties in the scheme that drives this. And my really big concern is really cost benefit in terms of where this will drive. And in fact, I've been thinking, um, did the NZASB go far enough? Um, I'm no longer on the board, <laughs> so, but I do wonder whether we should have taken that braver decision, Angus, which was actually let's change the principle to be an uncertainty in cash flow. Um, you know, what is to stop us doing that on the basis that 
it works pretty well now and your readers generally have an idea what it's about. Um, because I, I feel that um, as long as we stuck with these compensation words and your indifference between this cash flow and that cash flow, it all sounds a bit academic to me. And we're, const and we're at the risk, I think, of in the public sector having quite significant debates with auditors and, and what they do in the private sector coming into the public sector. And I think, how will this benefit users? You know, what is the benefit of answering what feels like an academic question? So I do wonder whether the bravest thing to do is say, look, if we accept that some sort of risk margin should be the uncertainty of cash, let's actually change the principle. Um, so then when you are trying to figure out your confidence level, um, you can just focus on one thing, which is measuring uncertainty and then perhaps lie on, rely on benchmarks. So, I mean, that's where I come from um, without being in practice. So I'm very interested in um, people actually in the insurance business, um, whether they think that that could work to depart from the IASB's basic building block principle, which is quite different from IFRS 4's appendices. Thank you, Angela. As I said, we did offer that to the board. <laughs> and uh, Ken's disclosure solution, I think we also put that one forward. That, that doesn't mean it won't come back. Um, any other comments on risk adjustments? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no and move on to the next questions. Angus, can I just say something, which is yeah. that uh, what I heard from both boards, but I guess I can only talk for New Zealand, really, although I'm a member of the Australian board, is there was some anxiety about changing the uh, standards in a way that could um, provide an opportunity for users of the standard from the for-profit sector um, and out to actually say, well, those people down the bottom of the world have you know, made these changes, especially around risk adjustments and things, and we can start using that in our for-profit space. So basically changing the standard in a way that wasn't public sector specific, but made it easier for the public sector. And there's certainly no, you know, we, we'd love to make it easier, but we wanted to keep the spirit of the standard because we weren't in a space where we could say, well, you know, we're just going to go off and write a standard that's completely our own. Um, so obviously there was a lot of uh, anxiety in Australia to, you know, to, to keep the spirit. In New Zealand, we want to, we also want to be transaction neutral as much as we can. There was no public sector standard to draw on. And um, yeah, we, we, we were very aware that the 75% had been, a um, you know, sort of historically has been used and that that might help people, but we, we didn't want to uh, make huge changes to the standard. So I, I just sort of wanted to make those comments. Um, I, you know, it's a very difficult balancing act as, as you would all appreciate. Yeah, thanks for that, Carol. I, I should have mentioned that, that obviously both boards have a framework that they work within, and both of those frameworks, as Carol said, um, indicate that if you're going to use an IFRS, you, the, the modifications should be public sector specific. There should be a public sector specific reason for making them if there isn't. Uh, it's a much, well, it, it's a high hurdle. Um, and, and a balancing act. Angela, did you want to weigh in again? I, actually, it was some Carolyn's uh, thoughts. I, I, was, I was thinking, yeah, I, I mean, you do have to argue the public sector difference. And I, but I think um, potentially, potentially we could argue user needs in the public sector um, around um, particularly this compensation which is not which I understand is not actually about charging 
a levy to cover the risk margin. In fact, it's got, it, it appears now from um, now that I've learned a bit more, well, I think it, it actually has nothing to do with what you charge or don't charge. It's more about the inherent risks in the actual scheme that's going to drive um, we sit on the risk margin measurement number and something quite risky, like catastrophic, that's kind of irregular is probably going to be at the higher end than something maybe a little bit more sort of run rate kind of insurance. So um, I think the word compensation is really confusing to both users and preparers. So, so bringing in this conversation idea um, is very tricky. I think there's a user need issue here that we could argue in the public sector. But to sort of Carolyn's point, um, we could, by changing the fundamental principle in the PBE standard in New Zealand to reflect the uncertainty in cash flows, effectively the status quo, you're actually diverging for a public sector reason, I would argue, and therefore the risk that you're somehow interpreting ISBs, um, it, you know, there's less risk of that criticism because you're actually in a different principle. Um, so if we if if it was something that we were you know that New Zealand was considering, it could be advantageous to take all the debate out of what do those compensation words actually mean, and not then be criticised for driving interpretation of ISB. Thanks, Angela. Andrea. Hi everyone, Andrea Glass, EQC. Um, just thinking about Ken's comment, and this is only a half-formed thought, um, a little bit what we can charge is, is going to vary according to the legislation every uh, entity is you know, set up under. And my reading of the new bill for a EQC, for example, is we can only charge the future cost of expected claims full stop. So no post-funding of our liabilities. Um, etc. And then other entities will be in a different position, so that um, it's going to play out slightly differently according to to um, what that legislation, excuse me, legislation says around around the pricing. Thanks, Andrew. Any other comments on risk adjustments before we move on? Okay, thank you. Um, on to coverage periods. Um, obviously, coverage periods are crucial um, for a whole range of reasons under 17. It's the period over which you recognise your revenue. Um, it also feeds into whether you're supposed to use the um, general model or the premium allocation approach, the simplified approach. The Board is proposing some modifications to the requirements, and we believe those are based on distinguishing factors that arise in the public sector. Um, one of the issues is the practical ability to reprice is a sort of crucial point under 17. As soon as you hit that boundary, if you're able to reprice for risk or reset the benefits based on the risks, that's when the con contract ends, the coverage period ends. Um, there's a little, sometimes a bit of lack of clarity in the public sector about whose decision that might be, whether it's the entity or it's the minister or it's um, a regulator. Um, so we've tried to remove uh, some of that uncertainty by saying, well, it's, a, it's more or less a, a collective decision of government um, about whether you, when you can reprice. Uh, the problem we were facing potentially was that if the minister made that final decision or a supervisor made it, and we said, well, the entity itself hasn't got a practical ability to reprice, you'd end up with perpetual contracts, which clearly isn't going to help um, the accounting outcome. The other thing is that a lot, and possibly most of the population of entities that we're dealing with are monopolies. Um, so, in other words, if you want to drive a car in uh, Victoria, you've got to insure with the TAC, full stop. So, the issue would be, well, if you're a monopoly, obviously you can 
potentially um, extract more money out of people for next year if you don't do so well this year. So you get this issue about whether, again, you've got a perpetual set of contracts because um, your ability to reprice is, is sort of based on this long-term perspective, potentially, because you've got the market power to do that. Um, also, some schemes in their legislation or perhaps um, the minister might want, uh, for example, a price increase spread over a particular period. Um, and that might be, say, five-year period, and when you're whereas you've got annual premiums. And I guess the danger of just applying 17 as it was, was to say that, well, if you've got this five-year time frame for putting through these price increases that we think you need to bear the risk uh, and not lose money, then you've got a five-year contract boundary or five-year coverage period. And again, the board wanted to provide relief um, in that respect. So that particular point alone wouldn't trigger a long-term coverage period. Um, so there's a series of questions about there about whether people agree or disagree with the sort of um, views that the board's come up with. And I guess what you would regard as a kind of softening um, of the requirements about when that practical ability arises for the entity to reprice for risks and or benefits. And I'd be grateful for any comments or input that you might have, whether we struck the right balance, um, whether perhaps you think some of this is unnecessary or we haven't gone far enough. I'm sure we can't have got it perfect. <laughs> <laughs> David. Yeah, I, I, I just reiterate my comments earlier about, you know, the situations where you don't have a direct premium to the, the benefits came through. Um, and the other one I had was, uh, it, I guess it's one I sort of pick up personally is the building, um, the building construction insurance, whether it's a, actually a six year policy or a one year policy or one event policy with a six year claim period. Um, so it seemed to be a little bit inconsistent in the, the standard on that. And, you know, there, there's a big difference between a six year policy and a, you know, a one year policy. So and just to clarify, is that the builder's warranty? Type? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is. An, I mean, that's an issue in the private sector as well. Yeah. I won't go into it now, but that, that is something we need to pick up. Any other comments? I'd probably just add that, you know, the easy ones seem to have an insurance policy, so they you know, that they were relatively easy and there seemed to be repricing of, of risk coming through based on whatever your financials are. Um, yeah, it was the, again, was those, for, for us, um, looking quickly, it was the catastrophic ones without the link that, that caused the problems. The, the others seemed to be relatively easy. Thanks, David. Jason. Um, it, nothing against what you guys have done there. But just one of the things that came out to me is some of the schemes that may potentially come in the scope of the standard may be covering for adverse development. Um, and where we have that, and we've seen that in the private sector, that's obviously been a point of contention because it's creating some longer duration contracts. So just another thing for if that's the intention coming out of this or if there needs to be another provision in the standard to cover that piece as well. Yeah, thanks for that, Jason. That is uh, an interesting aspect of IFRA 17. You're quite right. Any other comments? I, I guess just on Jason's point, I would uh, would be like 
we had looked earlier about whether there were adverse development covers out there. None sort of jumped out at us, but it would be interesting to know if we'd missed any. So this is where, for example, I, I've got a book of claims and I essentially, and I trans, potentially transfer them to somewhere else. So the coverage under IFRS 17 is the actual adverse development in that book of claims. Whereas under 1023 and the appendix to New Zealand IFRS 4, we would have just said, we well, just bought a claims portfolio, a bunch of claims, and you let those run off and treat them as if they were a claims liability. 17 says, no, that's not a claims liability. That's a, a liability for remaining coverage. And as Jason said, those can, those can run off over multiple years. Jane. Um, yes, I just wanted to echo that um, ICARE is particularly interested in adverse development and the impact of that because we appear to have a fairly new scheme that may not have been flagged earlier that will be impacted um, by this, this standard in, in that way if, if they come into scope. I'm so very keen to see any guidance or views in that space from the AASB. Thanks, Jane. We'd certainly like to hear about that one. Any other comments before we move on? Okay, um, I mean, we've got, got plenty of time to go, but uh, really it's just uh, whether there are issues that we haven't dealt with. Um, that last one on adverse developments probably among those uh, we didn't specifically deal with. So that, that's a good segue to this item. Um, but there are other things that have jumped out at you that you think the boards should have addressed. Um, but haven't in these proposals? Not me. <clears throat> Sorry, was there someone wanting to come in? Angus, um, one of the other things we need to speak about in the scope area, but one thing to think in the final drafting is there's a few other areas within the standard and appendix B that reference insurance contracts um, and how those might be amended. One I know that's come up in conversation is just around B27. Um, and some of that effectively calling out things that would not be in scope of the standard. Um, and whether or not that remains with your new indicators approach, or if it's applied first and then the indicators, it, I think it could be confusing. Um, and uh, noting the potential challenges around applying indicators in the first place, I think we just need to be clear around how those bits fit in. Okay, thank you for that. We'll look out for that one. David. Yeah, I've got a weird one um, and it's to do with captive insurers. Um, so I understand if the captive insurer you know, produces general purpose financial statements, then you know you should follow the standard. We've got a captive insurer that doesn't prepare its own general purpose financial statements. As, as far as I can understand, it's a sort of part of uh, a department um, not covered by the budgeting. But because it's covered by a department, it gets caught by the administered activities or potentially caught by the administered activities. Mm -hmm. So potentially it would have to follow this standard even though it's actually not producing general purpose financial reports uh, and gets eliminated on consolidation. So, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, we'll probably raise it in our submission letter or joint submission letter. Uh, but yeah, just to raise it, it it's it's an odd one um, that doesn't quite come with the, the, the reasoning and the logic you produce general purpose, you'd follow the standard type thing. Yep, just hadn't, thought of, hadn't thought of that one, David. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was only when I was going through the examples and thinking, oh, okay, um, understand this. So I don't know if anybody else has the, the same issue with... Um, you know, captive insurer. It, it's it's a captive insurer. I guess 
in a general term um, within government, but it, it's, you know, it's all the one legal entity. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, it's Anthony, and I'm uh, on the same uh, kind of uh, group as what David is in Queensland. So I'm, I'm uh, from the Office of the Auditor General WA. Um, I just want to just uh, reinforce David's earlier point that that we have a similar thing with um, the captive insurers, where um, yeah, the, the the actual entity that reports on it is is kind of like it's an administered. Um, type of thing and and that's also where we're we're not clear at the moment on whole of government um implications we 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 know that at whole of government pure whole of government consolidation it should all eliminate but if there's anything that goes across the sector like you know if if it's uh you know pnfc sector to the general government sector and so on and so forth there could be some some wrinkles to to kind of iron out there that but that we're still working through the standard to to get a better understanding of it but i just thought i'd just echo essentially what david said earlier thanks anthony much appreciated angus angela uh here again um i think that the discussion just there has has reminded me that and i don't know if it's a standard setting thing but at the Treasury, we, we need to work through it as well. But in a number of um, elements in the standard, it's very much an entity specific view, even the risk adjustment, you know, and, I, and I'm sort of conscious that um, maybe one of our, one of the insurance agency has a, a, a government guarantee. So as a board of directors, they might, might make assumptions about their risk appetite or they may, might, you know, based on what the standard requires, but then that scheme is consolidated into the whole of government accounts and, you know, no one's guaranteeing the government, but they certainly have the right to raise taxes. Um, so I did wonder working through different elements of, of this standard, could it drive a different measurement recognition at whole of government versus sort of an entity perspective? And I, I generally um, don't like that because effectively you've potentially for users, you have kind of two sets of views on the same thing. It's very confusing. So it is something I'm looking out for because I think we often, I don't know, we often focus on the general purpose financial reports of the insurance company. But what happens when it does get fed up to the whole of government and, and some of the, I guess, some of the perspectives change? But I don't know if that's a, a standard setting thing, you know, in the standard or for us to work through with our auditors. But um, yeah, it does open a potentially two different lenses. Yeah, I mean, I'd... I guess it's ironic in, in the sense because you could say oh, I've got a zero risk adjustment because I've got a government guarantee, but when it goes up to the whole of government, in theory, they'll go, well, I don't have that, so I'll have to have a risk adjustment, which would seem odd. Um, I guess, I mean, and it, I had thought that you would preserve the accounting on the way up. So if you had zero at the entity level, that's what you'd consolidate, or if you had a positive number, that's what you consolidate, but I agree there are different perspectives. Any other feedback um, people would like to provide while we have the chance? If not, we're going to give 40 minutes back in your day. Um, thank you very much indeed for attending today. Really appreciate your contributions. Uh, we will also be targeting a few of you for one-on-one -on -one discussions and anyone who wants to talk with us, if they could please contact um, Patricia, myself or Teresa or all three of us. 
um, we'd certainly welcome to have one-on-ones. I particularly understand in terms of the indicators it might be useful um, to talk about your entity in particular to see where things are going, might land. Um, so if you could be on the lookout for that, just to remind you that we've um, got about five or six weeks until the comment deadline. Um, so we'd particularly like to be speaking with people in that period in the lead up to when comments are due. Um, Patricia, did you have anything you wanted to add or Teresa before we signed off? Uh, no, maybe just a quick mention of our likely timeline. So, so the aim is to provide some of comments to the two boards at the August meeting, and hopefully by then the board can make decisions as to what would be the the end a US paragraph slash New Zealand paragraphs to add to the standard, and we can give an update after the August meeting. Thanks very much, Patricia. Teresa? Uh, yeah, New Zealand has the same deadlines and uh, we are also a mink for the August meeting. Yeah, thank you for that. All right, well, thanks again for your input today. We really appreciate it and um, stay tuned and we will be in touch directly with some of you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Angus. Thanks. Thank you.